Welcome everyone to uh, CMS Colloquium. Um, and uh, today we welcome James Wynn, who is Associate Professor of English and Rhetoric at Carnegie Mellon University. His research and teaching explore science, mathematics, and public policy from a rhetorical perspective. His first book, Evolution by the Numbers, examines how mathematics was argued into the study of variation, evolution, and heredity in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. His most recent monograph, Citizen Science in the Digital Age, explores how the internet and internet connected devices are reshaping the landscapes of argument occupied by scientists, laypersons, and governments. Uh, currently, well, today, I think, right, saw the publication <laughs> of Arguing with Numbers, um, a co edited uh, a volume that, that uh, Professor Wynn co edited, um, a collection of essays co edited with G. Mitchell Rays, whose contrib contributors investigate the relationship between rhetoric and mathematics. Uh, he is also working on a new book project on the rhetoric of Mars colonization, um, from which he'll be drawing in today's talk. Um, so uh, welcome, James, and, and um, I will pass things over to you. Thank you so much, Vivek, for the introduction. Um, I want to I want to acknowledge and thank um, Ed Schiappa, who is faculty at MIT. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that the uh, collection that is coming out today, um, Ed has a chapter in that. Um, so he is also part of that, that wonderful project. So I want to thank him for his participation and for inviting me here today to talk to everybody about another project I've been working on. Um, also, um, I want to thank you, Andrew, um, for setting everything up for the logistics, making this all happen, making sure my slides work, everything. Thank you for doing that. And Vivek, thanks for the introduction and also for being moderator today in our conversation. So um, as Vivek mentioned, what I'm gonna talk about today is actually some a new project that I've been working on. Um, in particular, uh, the first chapter of this book um, about Mars colonization. And so what I wanna share with you today is a little bit about my research project, um, my methods and concepts, and also um, then a little bit about my findings um, so far. Now, there are lots of things that I'm interested in and I've, I've worked on in the book. So you don't need to sort of, uh, if you have questions about other things, I'm happy to answer them. Um, but you know, I'll focus today on just one part of the project that I've been working on. So I'm gonna try, I'm gonna share my slides here. Um, and then I think we can go from there. Uh, are these slides visible? Can everybody see them? Okay, great, thanks. Thank you. All right, excellent. So I'm just gonna make sure I can get the full screen. So the title of my talk today is Promotional Narrative, Science Fiction, and the Case for Colonization. So there are a few things I'd like to talk about today. First of all, why Mars colonization? Uh, why is this particular topic exigent right now? Why is it worth thinking about or talking about? Also some of the concepts and methods that I'm using to do the analysis that I'm gonna share with you today. And of course my findings, the, 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 the sort of themes or issues that are de that developed out of the analysis that I've done. And finally discussion, um, this is gonna be on my part very brief because I wanna have a larger discussion with everything, everyone about um, the topics I'm covering in my talk. Um, I'm thinking that this will probably take about 40 minutes to, to, to talk through my slides and to, uh, to, to show my evidence and discussion, and hopefully we'll have a really nice discussion after that. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about the public exigence for this work. In other words, why am I interested in it? Why do I think it's something that we should be paying attention to right now? So first of all, you know, just two months ago, uh, Perseverance landed on Mars, and there's been a lot of hoopla and discussion about um, that particular moment of, of um, getting involved with Mars and taking the next steps towards sending people there. Um, in, two, in 2010, so essentially in the last five years, there's been a lot of political movement towards Mars colonization, or actually I should say in the, in the last decade, there's been a lot of movement towards um, actually devoting government resources towards sending humans to Mars um, and making Mars sort of a priority project for NASA. So um, in a speech in 2010 um, at, at Kennedy Space Center, 
Um, Obama said, for example, that the, by the mid 2030s, um, we will be sending humans into orbit around Mars and returning them safely, and then landing on Mars will follow. Um, President Trump actually signed the NASA Transition Authorization Act, which was developed under Obama, and then it was signed as one of the first things that Trump did when he came into office. And within that particular uh, document, that, that act, um, there is explicit language that the whole, one of NASA's main goals is to achieve the human exploration of Mars and beyond and to sort of prioritize this in everything it does. So in other words, if they're gonna build technology, um, it, should with, it should be built with forethought about going to Mars and how this is gonna impact that project. So in other words, a lot of the planning for NASA is now everything sort of is related to Mars and is about going, toward, going to Mars. Also, of course, we um, can't forget the interest in the private sector in Mars, particularly, of course, uh, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, uh, who have started their own rocket companies and have begun to privatize uh, space travel, um, which has some important implications, I think, for this. Of, of these two, of course, Elon Musk is, is very, very interested in Mars colonization um, and is hoping to see this in his lifetime. Uh, if you go to Musk's uh, webpage of SpaceX, there's a particular section on Mars. And in this section, he has this quote, you wanna wake up in the morning and think that the future is going to be great. And that's what being a spacefaring civilization is all about. I can't think of anything more exciting than being out there and being amongst the stars. So um, Elon Musk is very sanguine about Mars and that's sort of one of his, his main goals and main priorities in the development of his technology and his company. Um, before I sort of get into the, the, the data and the methods that I want to use, I want to just step back for a second and talk a little bit about the disciplinary perspective I'm coming from. Um, Professor Shiap and I share rhetoric as our disciplinary lens that we look at things through. Um, essentially, when I go to cocktail parties and people ask me, well, what is it you do? And I say, well, I'm a professor of rhetoric. And then they ask me, well, what do rhetoricians do? Um, I like to explain that rhetoric is sort of the, the, the study of argument in all of its splendor. And what, by, what I mean by that is that rhetoricians are really interested, um, unlike some other fields that study argumentation, in really the broad range of persuasive means, including emotions, including arguments from the character of, of people, of the speaker. Um, and of course, looking at these things in various contexts and across different kinds of media. So, for, my, for this project, I thought, um, I, I became very interested in colonization sort of generally, um, but specifically because I study rhetoric of science and public policy um, from the perspective of thinking about colonization in the context of Mars colonization. So from a disciplinary perspective, I wanna talk a little bit about the contribution I think that my project is making in the field of rhetoric. Um, most studies of colonization uh, in rhetoric and in other fields that are, that are closely associated with it, think about colonization as a completed act um, or thinking about the impacts of colonization after they happen. Um, what I'm really interested in though is thinking about colonization in these very um, early moments where, um, and I call these moments proto-colonial moments because in these moments, the colonial enterprise is very fragile and uncertain. So typically when people talk about colonialism, they look at already established colonial projects, ones that have succeeded. But I'm interested in those projects in very early stages when people aren't sure that they're gonna succeed. And they also need to really rely on argumentation to get to persuade people to really think about engaging in these projects. So some questions I'm really interested in are, one, you know, what are the rhetorical challenges for the colonizer? How do you get people to buy into colonial projects at a very early stage? Um, and also then how do previous colonial acts influence present colonial acts? And finally, you know, what do we learn um, by contrasting colonial proto-colonial moments? If we, and so for my project in particular, I wanna look at um, the colonization of North America. So these colonial moments and then juxtapose those with um, this proto-colonial moment we're having now, um, thinking about colonizing Mars. In order, to, in order to talk about these things though, I think it's important to have um, 
sort of a set definition or a definition that I'm going to be op operationalizing or using in my research of what colonialism is. So in particular, what I'm talking about is physical colonialism. Um, and what I mean by that are the movement of people from what are called source communities or metropolitan communities into um, which are where they come from into these target bases or target communities, which are foreign places. And also movements of people where they're moving into these spaces and they, they are intending to permanently reside in those spaces. So there's a lot of, um, there was a lot of uh, rhetorical back and forth and sort of arguing about colonialism as versus imperialism. Um, so a lot of the discussions revolve around the permanency of, of these versus imperialism, which tends to be less permanent and, and is sort of a shuffling of bureaucratic and military folks into a space and then shuffling them out again. Um, another important feature of colonialism, which differentiates it from other kinds of movements of people, um, is that there is a notion where that the people that are going to these foreign spaces maintain political identity and rely on the original state for their identity, their protection, the resources they need to sort of maintain their colonial presence in this target community. So these are some very basic um, definitional qualities that I'm using when I'm, when I'm talking about what a colony is and what colonialism is. One of the things that's also important to this project, and this isn't something that I've, I found in my research on defining colonialism or talking about what it means, is this, this idea of stages of colonialism. So by reading a lot of colonial tracts, um, it emerged for me that there are different stages of colonialism. The first stage is what I call the exploration stage, which is essentially you send out um, uh, people, or in the case of Mars, instruments um, that are there to sort of understand the, the resources and the conditions of, of the, the space that is, and, and to decide whether it has potential for colonization. Then you have a planting stage, which is where you put small outposts there. If you think back to the early colonial period in North America, um, these are typically forts um, with military folks um, that were there to establish a foothold, um, but they weren't sort of full-blown colonies. And next, of course, you have the settlement phase, which is where um, these forts begin to expand, and we get different sorts of, of, of people um, that begin to live there. So children, um, women, people from different walks of life, like, you know, blacksmiths and 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 barrel makers and so forth, right? So it's not just sort of a military operation, but it's a diversified, um, more um, heterogeneous population. And finally, the very last stage of colonialism is of course when it disappears. So it either disappears through emancipation. So uh, in the United States, obviously after the, after the war for independence, the United States became its own country. So it was emancipated from uh, its original colonial source or it's incorporated. So you can think about Ireland and Scotland, for example, which became part of, of Britain and the United Kingdom. Um, and so therefore there's a sort of like two ways it can go. You can either emancipate or you can become incorporated and you lose your status as a colony. For this uh, particular project, I looked at two sets of texts. So as a rhetorician, we study typically artifacts and typically written artifacts. Um, one set of texts I looked at are what are called promotional literature, and I'll say a little bit about what that means and what that is. So I looked at, 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 at 10 different texts, which are examples of promotional literature from the 16th and 17th century, um, and particularly during the English proto-colonial period of the settlement of North America from about 1495 to 1650. I also then looked at modern science fiction texts from the 20th and 21st century and I looked at seven of these. I mean, I read lots more, but there were only seven that seemed um, to be particularly impactful in talking about colonialism in very detailed and specific ways. In my analysis, what I did is a close reading of all these sources um, and close reading for thinking about particular kinds of questions. So one of the questions I was very interested in is how do supporters of colonialism um, persuade people to like leave their homes and go into these foreign spaces, which are typically very hostile. Um, and also, are there sort of common lines of argument that emerge from their efforts to persuade people to do this? 
And so through historical comparison, by looking at early modern texts um, and, and modern uh, literature about colonization, I was interested to see whether there were similarities and differences in the lines of arguments that we find and what might account for these similarities and differences. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about specifically the last question in the discussion part of my presentation. So let's, let's, talk, let's start with the early modern uh, proto-colonial period. So typically, you know, when people think about colonization, um, they typically think of colonization as something that people really wanted to do, um, either because there's some instinctual uh, nature within humans that wants to go out and explore places, or because they thought it was like some great, um, uh, I don't know, escape from their socioeconomic conditions or whatever. But in fact, uh, it was really hard to persuade people um, in to go to, to go to colonize or to be part of this sort of colonial project. And we see this time and time again when you look at these very early proto-colonial tracks. Um, so for example, um, John White's Planner's Plea, which is written in 1630, he, he is sort of emblematic of the kinds of things that you read or that, or that these folks that are writing these kinds of tracks write. So he writes in this, some men are content to remove from their dwellings and leave their beloved country and friends. Let no man conceive that we shall find over many of that humor. We English are known too well to the world to love the smoke of our own chimneys so well that hopes of great advantages are not likely to draw many of us from home. So many of the, the folks that write these tracks say, it's really hard to get people to leave. So then what I was really interested in is the arguments that they then made to try to get people to to buy into the colonial project and be participants in it. The kind of literature that emerged, so this, this actually emerges as a genre of literature during this period called what's called promotional literature. And typically what happened during this period is that some folks would go over and they would you know, be part of one of these fortress colonies um, that were meant to sort of stake things out and maybe make a, a, a military foothold to make a claim. And then they would come back and they would say very nasty things about um, being in the colony and how one, how not really wonderful it was. So a lot of promotional literature was sort of aimed at um, addressing these brutes, as they were called, um, where people were just sort of uh, talking badly about the colonial experience. Um, to, so as a definition of this genre, one of one historian writes, the principal purposes of promotional literature was to combat the flood of slander and malicious gossip about the colonies of which almost every important writer complains. So we have this promotional literature then that's meant sort of as a rhetorical tool to get people to think positively about the colonies. So one of the things I was interested in is, well, okay, you know, what kind of rhetoric do we find in these docu in these uh, this literature? And what I what I found is that typically in the early modern period we have what's called reassurance rhetoric. Um, there's a there's an argument theor theoretician named um, Chaim Perlman who talks about dissociative argument. Um, dissociative argument is essentially argument where um, you say, well, this is what they're saying, but what really is happening is this. So it's a dissociation of the imagined and the real. So a lot of argument in this vein is about trying to correct sort of uh, incorrect or inappropriate descriptions of the risk in the colonial space. So there were lots of different kinds of risks that these writers talk about in promotional literature. One of them, of course, is indigenous people. So here's an example of a colonist who went um, to Virginia. His name is Ralph Lane. And he came back and he wrote a very, a very uh, scathing negative uh, description of the experience that he had. So he writes about the indigenous people. There wanted no store of mischievous practices among them, the indigenous people of Roanoke. In the dead of night, they would have beset my house and put fire in the reeds that myself would have come running out in of a sudden amazed in my nightshirt without arms, meaning weapons, upon an instant whereof they would have knocked out my brains. So Lane is describing his fear that they were going, that the, that the Native Americans of the Roanoke um, were going to essentially slaughter all the colonists and that he would be a main victim and that they were gonna sort of set fire to his house and then, and then beat his brains out when he ran out. Um, of course, then the promoters of the, this colony um, needed to have some way of responding to these sort of uh, negative impressions that they were giving about the colony. 
Um, so another piece was written soon after Harriet's, I mean, soon after uh, the one we just read by Thomas Harriet, which is known as the Brief and True Report, written in 1587. And this report, um, Harriet tries to um, rehabilitate people's um, beliefs about Native Americans, suggesting that, you know, the slanderous accounts are incorrect. And really, there's a very different way that we should think about the Native Americans. So he writes, it resteth that I speak a word or two of the natural inhabitants, their natures and manners, as that you may know how that they, in respect to troubling our inhabiting and planting, are not to be feared, but that they shall have cause to both fear and love us that shall inhabit with them. So he was really trying to change everybody's mind about these stories that they were hearing about the dangers of the Native Americans. Um, I'm not going to offer all the evidence here, but what I can tell you is that he makes a series of arguments, one, based on the fact that their militaries are not very big, and also that the weapons that they have are much cruder than the English, and therefore, they're not really much of a threat, militarily speaking. He also, he also makes a sort of technological argument, arguing that the Native Americans were so amazed by their technologies that they, in some ways, thought that they were, they were to be respected and worshipped. Um, because their God was so superior and and that they would sort of fall in line um, just out of sheer, uh, I don't know, a belief that the technology was superior so that they would just they would just sort of go along with whatever the English uh, believed in. Um, there were other hazards and risks, of course, outside of native peoples. Um, there is a lot of discussion in these in these tracks about hazardous fauna. Um, in the planner's plea, for example, um, White talks a lot about snakes. Uh, people were really afraid of these snakes. They were bigger than the ones in England. So he had to say, say a few words about the fact that no, no one really ever sees them. And the more people that go, the less snakes there'll be. So the idea here is to sort of dismiss out of hand the dangers of these snakes, their existence, and um, the fact that they're going to really have a problem with the colonists. The other thing are mosquitoes. Um, so England didn't really have mosquitoes, but of course, North America was plagued by them, especially in the places that, that these colonies were, were set down. Um, so one of the things they had to say is, look, the mosquitoes aren't that bad, right? You can wear long sleeves, you can go indoors, you can set fires. And, you know, frankly, if you live there after a while, you don't even notice them. So these are some strategies that they, they had to, to sort of reassure um, potential colonists that these problems weren't really that serious problems. Now, another risk that um, people in the early modern period took very seriously was the effect of the food and climate and drink on the bodies of the colonists. So this is a very big deal at this period, um, and now, of course, as well. So um, William Bradford, when he talks about the history of the Plymouth Plantation, he talks in great detail about the arguments that um, the group of Calvinists that, that joined him in Plymouth had over the kinds of problems that they were going to face and why they should or shouldn't colonize or decide to build to have a colony um, in North America. One of these debates is, is based squarely around the conditions and the effects of the conditions on the bodies um, of the members of his congregation. So for there in North America, they should be liable to famine and nakedness and the want in a manner of all things. The change of air, diet, and drinking of the water should infect their bodies with sore sickness and grievous diseases. So this is one of the arguments made against uh, setting up a colony in North America. To sort of counter that, we have, we have um, tracks like John Brereton's A Brief and True Relation. Um, so Brereton tra essentially was traveling around Martha's Vineyard and he comes back and he, and he says a few words about the food and the drink and how it affected the folks that were in his particular expedition. We found our health and strength all the while we remained there so renewed and increased as notwithstanding our diet and lodging was none of the best. Yet none of our company felt the least grudging or inclination to any disease or sickness, but were much fatter and better health than we went out of England. So there are a lot of instances in these tracks where they will talk about how the food and the drink and everything else actually made the, the colonists healthier and didn't have the negative impacts on the health that was brooded by some of these other um, accounts of, of the new world. Um, so um, I'm going to switch gears now. So I've been talking about North America and the colonial experience there. So there are some, some similarities and differences, obviously, between North America and Mars. 
Um, one of the differences, of course, is there, to our knowledge, there are no indigenous inhabitants of Mars. We have not found life there yet. Um, so, and, and the other thing is that no humans have ever been there. So we can't have the same kinds of accounts um, and, and brutes of the experience of being on Mars because no one's ever done it. Also though, there is a similarity because there are some climactic hazards on Mars that we don't share in our own, um, in our own Earth. Now, of course, the climactic hazards are very different than the one, the climatic hazards are very different than the ones that you experience in North America. First of all, the average temperature is much colder on Mars uh, than it is on Earth. This is not something, there are temperature problems um, that colonists had to deal with, but not to this extreme. Um, oxygen, so we never had to worry about oxygen um, when, when setting up colonies uh, in North America or other places on Earth. Um, and of course, there is, problems of radiation. Um, there's a lot more radiation um, on a, that, that's given on a daily basis on Mars than there is on Earth. So there are definitely risks, obviously environmental risks to talk about when we talk about Mars. Um, so because there are no, uh, there's not the same kind of uh, writing about colonization for Mars that there was for North America, uh, we have to turn to a new source. And so one of the sources that we have is science fiction. So um, science fiction is great because even though there's not a, there hasn't been a human experience on Mars, science fiction writers imagine what it would be like to set up a colony on Mars and imagine what it would be like to be the humans that are colonizing and what their experience would be like. Um, what's also very interesting is that science fiction writers like, like, um, Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke and Ray, Ray Bradbury um, were very supportive of the notion of astrocolonialism. Um, even Ray Bradbury, who, who does write very critically about colonialism, for example, in the Martian Chronicles, um, has other writings where he is sort of very sanguine about this idea of astrocolonialism. So for example, for the 1964 World Fair, um, he wrote a particular script uh, for this journey through um, America, um, in which in the final part of the script, he writes, build pyramids of men and fire toward landfalls on the moon and bright new independence days, looking back from space to see our birthplace earth. The old wilderness dwindles as the human race reaches for eternity, survival and immortality in the next billion years. Man, God made manifest, goes in search of himself, the great outpour of all nations, which crushed the buffalo grass, and reach the end of one frontier now binds great now finds greater challenges in the star wilderness above. Um, so we see in this the very language of colonialism, the very language of sort of the, the westward expansion of the buffalo grass in Bradbury's comments. So it suggests that he too um, is sort of um, enamored by uh, the notion of the colonial, um, the astro-colonialism of other planets. So what we find uh, that's a little bit different in science fiction writing than in earlier colonial tracks is that the rhetoric here, instead of being reassurance rhetoric, is what I would call inspirational rhetoric. And there are sort of two sorts. One is what I would call heroic inspirational rhetoric, and the other is utopian inspirational rhetoric. Um, heroic inspirational rhetoric is really interesting because what it does is instead of trying to reassure um, the, the readers and, and the audience, that life on, on in the colonial space isn't so bad. They actually leverage the challenges and the struggle for existence within the colonial space to make, to, to valorize, um, to make people heroes. And by doing that also valorizing the process of colonialization and the people that are gonna become colonialists. So we see this um, very obviously in um, Andy Weir's The Martian, which um, many of you probably have seen as a film or you've read in, in the novel form. Um, in this novel and in, in the film, of course, we have the protagonist, Mark Watney, um, who is a scientist. Uh, he's a botanist engineer, and he uses his maker skills and his rational thinking ability to, of course, um, send off um, one disaster for another. Um, and by doing that, sort of becomes a hero by his ability to sort of conquer the challenges of Mars as a space. We also see the same thing happening in Isaac Asimov's The Martian Way, which is written in 1952. And 
in Asimov's novel, there's also sort of a hero scientist who's an engineer. And the idea is that, that Mars is being cut off from water and they have to solve this problem um, sort of through their own ingenuity. And, and I won't um, spoil the plot of this, um, but what I can say is that um, what's different a little bit about the Watney example and this heroic example is that the hero in the case of um, the Martian way draws their, draws their very ability to make and do certain kinds of things from their uh, from their existence as colonists. In other words, only Martians, only someone who lives on Mars and deals with the conditions, can do the kinds of um, techno can do the kinds of technological things that make survival possible. Um, so uh, Asimov, Asimov writes, for example, we can we can do it, and Earthmen can't. They've got a real world. They've got open sky and food. Getting into a ship will challenge them, right? We've been living on a ship our entire lives, breathing packaged air, drinking packaged water. We eat the same food and rations we eat aboard a ship. We get into a ship, the same thing we've known all our lives. So the colonial conditions themselves um, condition the settlers to actually be able to survive in ways that folks that are not Martian um, can't do. So they can sort of solve problems in ways that Earth people can't solve problems. So now I want to switch a little bit and talk about inspirational rhetoric. Um, and I call this, this argument that, of inspirational rhetoric as, as argument per arduer or argument through adversity. And what we see here is what's called a means ends argument. So um, in this kind of argument, the, the, the person, the, the colonist is submitting themselves or the potential colonist is submitting themselves to extraordinary trials, which are the means and the ends are the extraordinary benefits that you reap through these trials. So the idea is that going to Mars is hard, but through this hardship, um, we get these unique benefits. Um, and there is, a, there is a, a rich history of this kind of argument in our own colonial experience, in our own colonial tracks. Um, so Frederick Jackson Turner, um, in his very famous piece on the frontier, writes, it is to the frontier the American intellect owes its striking characteristics, that coarseness of strength combined with acuteness, inquisitiveness, inquisitiveness and practical, that practical inventive turn of the mind, quick to find expedience and masterful grasp, grasp of material things. Our traits are called out elsewhere because of the existence of the frontier. So the notion is that the frontier in some ways um, is responsible for the kind of traits that made America, America that made it great, that made it unique. Um, and so we, but it's only through the trials of the frontier that you get those kind of qualities. And we see this very same argument being made in science fiction texts. Um, a perfect example of this is Arthur C. Clarke's The Red Sands of Mars. Um, and in this book, we have the protagonist, Martin Gibson, who's a journalist, and he's sort of writing an expose on Mars. He's gonna journey to Mars and talk about what colonial life is like and so forth. And he's really skeptical at first about, about the colonial project, right? He says, you know, look, from the point of view of Earth, you know, Mars is a long way. It costs a lot of money. It doesn't offer anything. And the question that we're all asking is, what do we get out of it, right? So the whole point of this novel then is to answer this question, what do we get out of it? And after spending time in the colony, um, Gibson has this sort of epiphanal experience and then he becomes a strong advocate. In fact, he becomes the PR person for Mars. Um, and what he finds is that he experiences, when he gets in with, with the folks on Mars, right, um, he begins to understand that what they gain from being on Mars in their colonial experience, right, is this keen-eyed competence and readiness to take well-calculated risks, which enabled them not merely to survive on this heartbreakingly hostile world, world but to lay the foundations of the first extraterrestrial culture. So this notion that, you know, the, a utopia or a return to utopia begins to develop through existing within the harsh conditions of Mars. Another example of utopian rhetoric is in Kim Stanley Robinson's uh, novel, Red Mars, which is part of a, a trilogy. Um, so what's interesting is that in, in Robinson's novel, there are a hundred colonists that are the original colonists of Mars. 
And the whole point of this novel is to talk about how they struggle to realize their utopian vision for a particular colony. And it's really the struggle itself um, and, and sort of maintaining a pure space um, for Mars, which is, uh, which is the struggle that if they succeed, will have this sort of utopian benefits. So one of the main characters writes, all of our, our says, all of our governments are flawed. It's why history is such a bloody mess. We are now on our own, and I, for one, have no intention of repeating Earth's mistakes. We are the first Martian colonists. We are the scientists. It is our job to think things new and make them new. So the idea is that Mars is really a tabla rasa in which we can build this ideal society on. And the struggle is not so much the struggle of existence on Mars, but the struggle to keep this a free space in which to create this ideal colony or this ideal utopia that the Martians want. So now very briefly, I'm just gonna talk about the, 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 the sort of the, the contrast we see between the rhetoric of early modern colonialism and the rhetoric of science fiction and Martian colonialism. So early modern promotional rhetoric is devoted to reassuring potential colonists and supporters by dismissing and diminishing the risks of colonial life, right? Oh, don't worry about the serpents, don't worry about mosquitoes, or the indigenous uh, peoples there, everything is gonna be fine. Inspirational rhetoric, however, of the modern science fiction leverages the risks of colonization to valorize the colonists and to make a case for the good consequences that will arise from the colonial act, right? You will become a hero. Um, you will realize uh, utopian visions that you have on earth. So why, why these differences? What might account for it? So in thinking about these different cases, one thing that occurred to me is that in our modern context, right, we have a real faith in sort of the techno-scientific capacity to address risk in a way that early modern folks did not. So they had to, in fact, offer reassurances. Why? Well, because they couldn't really say that they could solve the problems. But now we have this sort of belief in technology and belief in the technological progress such that we can almost valorize um, these, these moments of, of colonialism as a way of showing our chops, of a way of showing how we can solve the problems and make ourselves heroes by doing so. The other thing that's interesting is that um, in early modern colonialism, in the, in the British context, there's not really a lot of ideal models um, that can serve as this notion of colony as utopia. I mean, the, the Scottish colonization and the Irish colonization were kind of a big bloody mess for the most part. They didn't really have very much ideal. There wasn't a lot of idealism associated to, with it. And there were a lot of um, writings by historians that suggest that they can't really find this kind of utopian statements very early in these proto-colonial periods, but they do find them later. And we see, of course, historically that these develop and, and modern science fiction writers have these as resources for making their arguments. Okay, that's all that I have. Um, so uh, Vivek, I will turn it back over to you um, for moderation purposes. So thank you so much for listening. Great, thank you. Um, well, I'll first open it up to questions from our, from our students. Yeah, Natalia. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering what made you choose the early American exploration um, rather than, I guess, like what I think a lot of people compare, which is like the Westward Ho sort of um, like frontier period. Thank you, uh, Natalia. So that's a great question. So one thing I want to say is that, you know, the reason, first of all, kind of um, I chose the British colonialism because I speak English. Um, and frankly, you know, I don't have the chops to read, you know, Spanish texts or texts in other languages. But the reason why I chose um, North American colonialism and not westward expansionism is because at that stage, so there's an argument about whether that's really colonialism in the first place, because America um, is technically a nation and those lands are part of the nation. Although there's a, there's a debate over whether or not, and I, I tend to, to come down on the side that, Yes, that is a colonial moment as well. The difference is that I'm looking at proto-colonial moments, right? So in the proto-colonial moment, um, there's, a, there's a lot of uncertainty 
um, about the, the capacity to even establish a foothold or whether you want to establish these colonies or whether you can get people to go there. I mean, there is some of that, of course, in the westward expansion. Um, but I think there's there's a stronger analogy with um, Mars and the, the sort of North American um, settlement or this, the, yeah, essentially because, um, you know, these people are really going out into these unknown spaces um, and they're, you know, they're, they're sort of uh, bases far away. And it's much more, I think, more like uh, Mars colonization. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, Kelly. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, I guess I was just wondering, your, your talk was very much framed from the perspective of the colonizer. So like when you frame talking about indigenous peoples, you label them as like risks or harms, mm -hmm. or like you just said, you know, with these people going out into the unknown where you don't know what's out there, but people do know, I mean, there are people living there that do know what's out there. Um, and there's always like an other side to that story. Um, so I guess I wonder how, like why not, why not talk about some of the harms that have happened in the process? And I'm sure in the Mars case, maybe it's not that there are people there, but that there are people harmed in this process of thinking about a single framework for utopia that doesn't include everyone and kind of how even in your talk, continuing to label these people as like harms or risks perpetuates that violence kind of. Thank you, um, Kelly, for that question. So what I want to say to everyone is this is part of a larger project. So I'm just starting it and my first chapter happened to be on this, um, but I will have a later chapter that is about um, sort of anti-colonial arguments, right? So there will be a whole chapter that I'm gonna dedicate to those questions specifically. Um, but the other thing that I would say, Kelly, is that what's, what I find interesting is that people in the humanities have done a lot of work on the colonized, but they have done very little work on the colonizers. Um, so to me, as a, as a rhetorician that's interested in argument from whatever, from whoever's perspective, it's interesting to me that no one really has written much about the colonial arguments, the arguments of the colonizers and why you would want to colonize and how do you get people to go there. So these are, I think, spaces that are that's underexplored, um, which is why I decided to explore them in the first place. Um, the other thing I would say about indigenous people, um, my project is is about thinking about how they're imagining these these groups and how they're talking about it, right? So because I'm writing, because so, I'm analyzing the argument from their perspective, that's how they're talking about it. So um, I'm not trying to um, perpetuate violence. I'm just trying to open up a discussion about this is how they were seen. This is how they were thought of by this group, right? And then, of course, this can be critiqued in a thousand ways, but it's, I think it's valuable in the first place to know what kind of language, what kind of um, place that these indigenous peoples had in their arguments, how they thought about them, how they argued about them, right? Does that make sense? So it's not that I, it's not that my intention is to ignore um, the opposite position, um, but that I'm taking, I'm, I'm looking at this from one particular lens in this chapter, but later chapters, you know, then we can swing the lens and look at it from a different perspective. Um, yeah. I, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Kelly. I'm just gonna say, yeah, I, 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 that makes a lot of sense. And I think you're totally right that like, looking at it from that perspective is helpful. I just think maybe when talking about it, it's good to kind of acknowledge that because I think it can still be traumatic for people to like see those images and hear that rhetoric. And so maybe just acknowledging that is worthwhile. Oh yeah, I mean, this is certainly traumatic, um, um, especially because the more you read these, you more you see the trauma that happens, right? Because in these tracks, they talk about what they did and what happened and they're very traumatic, yeah. But I think it's important to expose that trauma and to expose those perspectives, right? As part of um, what I call, what rhetoricians call disoi logoi, which is seeing different, uh, different sides of a particular issue or perspective. Um, so I wanted to just follow up on, on those two questions as well. Um, you know, as, cause I know that there are some of us here who are descended from people who were colonized. Um, 
and for whom that that trauma is very real and continual and and transgenerational. Um, and I guess um, from from the standpoint that you're talking about, um, you know, focusing on the rhetoric that the rhetoric that was used to encourage colonization from the side of the colonizers. Um, I guess I would urge you to to um, to think about the the underlying. There's an underlying rhetorical move, right? Um, that is that the United States is terra nullis, right? That that the United States is not occupied, right? Or North America or, you know, those lands between the Pacific and the Atlantic, because um, I'm not going to call them that um, yet. So um, for, for this territory to be considered terra nullis, in other words, unoccupied territory, there is a really deep rhetorical move that's being made that's essentially, um, you know, the rhetoric and, and the technology of race. Right, which renders the the indigenous inhabitants as part of the landscape, rather than as human beings occupying the the land for generations. And so, you know, there's that. I think that's where the difference between um, talking about North America and talking about Mars is so apparent. Because um, if if you make that comparison without um, acknowledging that um, in the same way that, that Mars is being considered as colonizable, right? Um, because it's empty. Um, that's essentially the argument that was made about North America. And that that argument was, was one that entailed violence, you know, and enabled it. Right, so um, I guess that's that's what I would urge you to think about, um, and also to think about the colonial moment, not as the early colonial moment, right, um, where the colonial moment ends, as as you were mentioning, when the the colonizers break off from the home country, but to think about the fact that settler colonialism was a continual process. And so even if the East Coast uh, of, of this region was settled by colonists who had broken off from Britain, they were still in a pre-colonial or proto-colonial relationship to the rest of the, the country, right? Yeah, I mean, I. It's interesting because I think that the, the notion of terra nullis is a little bit fraught. Um, on the one hand, um, there is sort of there are sort of property arguments about you know land that's available, but I think that what these tracks show is that they are painfully aware that these lands are people, um, and that that's a risk, um, and that there are real people there. They are ri they they are like them. They are and that they can fight and that they are a risk. So I I don't. I wouldn't say that that they they're going into this thinking like oh nobody's there like I think they're very painfully aware and that it's part of their the fact that they have to write things like oh it's fine you know there are people there but they're not gonna you know try to to harm us if we live there so I mean I, I think that that I'm not sure that that's necessarily true of the rhetoric of that of that of that situation. Mm. Um, but it but it is interesting because there there and of course there's a, so much going on in in this period, like you know the fact that um, the 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 Spanish and the Portuguese have essentially had the world divided between them, um, but with the blessing of the Catholic Church. So um, technically, this isn't even a space where the the British are allowed to go. Um, but after the the you know great battle of the Spanish Armada. And the, the 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 English winning that battle, then they feel a little bit more okay with you know setting up settlements and places. I mean, it's very it's it's a very complicated story. Um, but I don't want to diminish I don't want to diminish in any way the violence that were that were done to the native peoples and and it continue to be done right. So this notion that you mentioned, um, what's and it's called in in the literature neo colonialism, right? This notion that colonialism keeps going and going and going, like you can't escape it. 
um, even after the fact, um, it still is perpetuated within the system with movies and TV and all kinds of media. Um, so I'm not I'm not negating any of that, but I will say that you know I am taking a particular lens and perspective to look at this through the perspective of the, of the colonizers and how they're trying to get people to go to that space. Um, I think it is important to think about the difference between Mars and North America, especially with the notion of um, indigenous persons or indigenous life there. Because so far as we know, there are, we have not found life on Mars yet. Um, and so the, the, some of the issues that um, are very present in discussion of colonialism on Earth um, may be either absent or different in thinking about the colonialism of Mars. And, and the, 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 the presence of sentient people who would be colonized um, or destroyed or, you know, what, whatever, is a different question on Mars. So, yeah. So thank you thank for you. that feedback. In other words, thank you. Um, there's some questions actually that are in the Q&A. Um, all right, from Jason Lynch, what do you see as the relationship between colonialism and capitalism? Relatedly, have you read or watched The Expanse? <laughs> and what are your thoughts on its politics of colonialism, exploitation, and labor? Yeah. Um, and then there's an addition to that. Do you see any differences between imagining of Mars colonization versus other interplanetary and interstellar notions of colonization? Thank you. Those are great are you, questions. Are you seeing the QA bar as well? I am. Thank you. So, uh, yes, I see that. That's at the top by Jason. Thank you, Jason, for your question. Um, yes. Uh, it's, it's interesting because colonization and capitalism are, are very, very much intertwined, but in ways that we don't always expect. Um, so what, what I found interesting is that many of the early efforts of, of the English to set up colonies were actually business ventures. Um, and the, the thing is that in the very early, so the very early colonial efforts, especially in Newfoundland, which is where the English first went, Around 1495, which is very early, right? A couple of years after um, Columbus. Um, and initially, um, the, the folks that went there, like Cabot and others, um, when they went, they couldn't get any, they had to like essentially sell people a story. Like, we're going to find the Northwest Passage. I mean, the Northwest Passage, so I want to, I don't, I, I know this has probably been a long time since you know, in high school history or whatever that you've talked about that Northwest Passage, but I can't emphasize enough how important the, the idea of the Northwest Passage was because at the, at this point, um, trade and, and was, was really built around stuff coming from the East, spices, silks, all these kinds of things. And the way that it came into the West and to Europe was through the Middle East. And because of religious differences, um, there was some tensions there about, you know, dealing with um, non-Christian folks. Um, and also there was a problem of pr prices, right? So by the time silk went from China and ended up in a port on the Mediterranean that you could actually go and get it from, um, it was really, really expensive. So for these, um, I, I really like to call them entrepreneurs because Cabot in particular and some of the early folks were entrepreneurs like they were saying like if we find this passage we are going to be rich beyond our wildest dreams because we're going to be able to bring spices and silks and there'll be no metal man we're going to get all the we're going to get all the the benefit um we could charge lower prices you know this is going to be great so the idea is that and and what's interesting about north america is when the spanish went into the south um they found a lot of gold and resources um, the, the British and some other folks thought that they would find the same in the North and they didn't. And so for a long time, North America was just not, not really that important because frankly, there were, they weren't finding the Northwest Passage and they weren't finding any gold. So, um, if you look at the early, I mean, it was very, it was, it was kind of bad business. And a lot of, a lot of the early colonial efforts just failed because they couldn't, they couldn't show profit. They couldn't make a buck. And in fact, the only thing that kind of saved North America, I mean, looking at it from the, from the business perspective, um, is sassafras. 
um, because sassafras was in high demand in England. It was all over North America. It was very cheap to transport and you can make a book off of it. So it's, it's strange how like fish and sassafras were things that kept people kind of interested in going to North America when in fact, um, for the most part, it was really kind of seen as a bad business deal. So I know that's a really long, that's a really long answer to your question, but I hope it shows like how integral sort of capitalism is to thinking about even the possibility of colonization because it was a huge risk. It was a huge financial risk and without reward, people were not willing to do it, which again is why in the proto-colonial proto period, there's a lot of interesting rhetoric and arguments about the economics of it. Okay, sorry. That's a long, that's a long answer. But no, I'll go to, uh, go to another question. Um, are there any questions on the, on the screen before I go back to the Q and A? Okay. Um, so let me see. I, I took one from Q and A, and I'm going to take one from chat now. Um, uh, this is from Ricardo Perez. Um, rhetoric is a fascinating exploratory discipline. The first colonizers to America were mainly convicts searching for liberty from imprisonment. That was a major motivational factor enabling the exploration. There was also a myth of richness that may have been instrumental in the genesis of the process. Um, so, oh, and then, oh, there is a question at the, um, at the bottom and why was Avatar not considered in your rhetoric exposition? Thank you. Um, Avatar is great. It's a perfect example of like multinationals coming into a pristine environment and destroying it. Um, I didn't. I didn't use it because it's not Mars. Um, all of the all of the science fiction I looked at was specifically about Mars and Mars colonization. Um, so all of the novels I read were were squarely about that. Um, just because it was my topic area, not because I'm not interested in Avatar and other examples like The Expanse, and because um, there's so much out there. Um, so thank you for that question. But that's that's really I was trying to focus on Mars. Um, from Hamid Reza Nasiri uh, in the Q and A, um, thank you for the interesting talk. Two questions, if you have time for both. Um, uh, first, it's interesting that here. Uh, here, when we focus on Mars colonization, we read, sorry, this is jumping over my page the way that I've got it. Um, it's interesting that when we focus on Mars colonization, we read those sci-fi works literally, but at the same time, many of those sci-fi novels and films have been making the case for American neocolonialism in an allegorical way. Uh, how do you deal with this kind of dialectic between allegory and literal? in such sci-fi works? Yeah, I mean, I think um, what's interesting is that these works, and, and we may not be thinking about this, but these works really do um, circulate within the American public and prime the American public to think about colonization in particular ways, to valorize it um, and to imagine it in particular ways. So I think that these that these instruments, I mean, NASA knows this. I mean, The Martian was sponsored by NASA, was vetted by NASA writers, I mean, by, by folks at NASA. So, I mean, they realize that this is a way to help shape the story or the frame um, of colonization of Mars. Um, and I don't know if you guys watch the National Geographic uh, Mars series, that's a great series. Um, all of these series are really designed specifically to make particular kinds of arguments about what it's gonna be like, why we're doing this. Um, it's very important to, is sort of like um, a prelude to actually doing it, right? You have to prepare the audience to, to see this in a particular way before then they're willing to like open the checkbook of the national government and spend money on these things and spend their lives going there if they do. Okay, I'm gonna go to Kenneth Alba, and then I'll come back to Hamid Reza to your second question. Um, I wonder if you could speak to the way that hard science fiction like Red Mars uh, comes bundled with epistemological claims that end up supporting ideological claims. I really liked, really liked the proto-colonial text you brought up, but the comparison that always jumps to mind for me is the uh, 
uh, Robinson date, Robinson aid, Robinson Crusoe, um, when where the focus on accounting and details and so forth has certain truth claims grounded. Uh, could you speak to uh, speak a bit to how genre specificity and epistemology interact in these kinds of neocolonialist texts? Wow, that's a very rich question. So there's a lot there to talk about. Um, it's interesting, Robinson Crusoe, there are a number of films and there's one novel that's an amazing, it's, it's, called, it's called Robinson Crusoe on Mars. It's a great novel um, by, by, I think his name is Rex Morgan. He's an Australian writer uh, or British writer, Australian, Australian writer that writes, goes to Britain and writes about this in Britain. Um, but yeah, the Robinson Eight does appear in, in, in different instances um, in discussions about Mars and Mars colonization, particularly the notion of like the marooned, like if you think about Andy Weir's The Martian, like this notion of the marooned um, scientist or the marooned explorer on Mars. So you do have that as sort of a trope that goes through some of the literature. Um, but I, I, this notion of hard science fiction, I think is very important because um, in my estimation, the more real the science fiction is, um, the more real that it seems that it's true. So one of the things about The Martian that I find really kind of compelling as an example is in the movie, it seems like this is real, like people are already on Mars, like they're really doing this, they can really survive. So the realism of it, I think, supports um, the supports the premise that we could do this, or we have done this, or we can do this. Um, so I think that the genre matters. Like if it's all sort of you know really super fictional and 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 um, not quite so true to life, um, I think it it's harder to make the case that this is true or this can happen or we should do this. So I think like Weir's novel and this, and Robinson, who, who, you read that, you believe that people are there. You believe that you could do this and that this is how it's gonna, go, it's gonna unfold. Um, so I think the, re, the, the hard science fiction is extremely important genre in thinking about um, arguments for Mars colonization. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to, let me see. I'll come back to Hamid Reza. Um, the second question, um, also, I'm curious whether you're considering making comparisons between the rhetoric used for the case of Israel and the discourse mm -hmm. arguing that life actually originated on Mars and then transferred to Earth, the argument of original home for colonialism. Interesting. So actually, um, I had been thinking about Israel, but not in that sense, like the notion of like life starting on Mars and then coming to Earth. Um, I really haven't thought about that. So that's a great angle and thank you for that. Um, but I have been thinking about um, colonization in different spaces. And so this notion of setting up um, uh, kibbutzes as sort of being also um, as a way of thinking about colonization, um, is that colonization? If so, why or why not? Or you know, what, what is the sort of language? What are the arguments um, for these kinds of settlements? Um, I think I, I've looked into it a little bit, not a lot, but I was kind of intrigued by this notion of thinking about whether there might be some analogs there that would be useful to help me think about um, colonial arguments and colonial moments. Okay. Um, Ali has a question. Do you want to, um, do you want me to take the question from the chat or would you like to Oh, I, I didn't drop it in okay. the chat. Sorry. Oh, okay. um, I can I can just say it. Um, okay. I was also really interested in your reading of Kim Stanley Robinson's uh, Red Mars series. Um, I really wanted to ask you about your reading of it as utopian and heroic, which is really interesting to me, especially with the overtones of like the Martian exceptionalism and the people on Mars are going to achieve X, Y, and Z. Um, and especially just with like the the how how the fault lines show in that I, I was wondering how the how that exceptionalism plays into the narrative of colonization if that makes sense i can play yeah yeah it's yeah. so i mean like this notion that like we are an exceptional people therefore you know we have the right to colonize here or it is our destiny to colonize here sort of thing or, or the sense that uh people who are on mars are um 
the I believe the quote you used was uh, we won't make Earth's mistakes or something yes, along those lines, yeah. um, that kind of thinking. Yeah, I mean, um, so it's really interesting because uh, in the beginning of Robinson's book, you have 100 colonists, right? And they train in Antarctica and they're supposed to give like reasons why they want to go to Mars. And most of this is supposed to be like, oh, well, I'm really interested in this science or we could do this thing. But when they all get on the spaceship and they're away from Earth, they're all like, screw it. The reason we want to go to Mars is we want to build a new society because we're tired of Earth and the way that, you know, Earth society and capitalism and everything's messed up. And we're going to start sort of a really a new utopic world on Mars. Um, and of course, what's interesting about the novel is that um, at the very about ha half of the novel, the first half, they're able to do this. And they're, they're you know, they've they created this place called Underhill um, and they've They've started to um, make their utopian ideas come true in some small ways. And they're thinking of, and planning how to do it. And then they find gold on Mars. And the minute gold is found on Mars, all the transnationals show up. And all of a sudden, it's just like Earth again, right? Um, and so there's this notion of there's this constant tension between like, and then they have to go underground and they become revolutionaries. Like, I don't want to rule the whole plot of the, the novels, but... But I, I think there is this notion that, you know, their ideas are pure um, and correct and and that all everything that Earth stands for with capitalism and and big government. Right. Um, and not allowing like small self-government or allowing people to form their own groups and, and do have their own lives. I mean, I think Kim Stanley Robinson is a libertarian. So much of the libertarian thinking kind of comes out in his novels. Um so I don't know if I'm answering your question, Ali, um, uh, but I think there is this notion that that this is the right way to think about how the world should be, um, which is essentially an anti-capitalistic perspective, but then things are more egalitarian. Thank you. Great. Natalia had her hand up a moment ago. Yeah, um, so I am I work in exoplanets and oh. um, I have also seen that um, in the space community at MIT and Aeroastro as well, there's been a big move um, in changing the language of how we talk about humans going to the moon, uh, to Mars, or like in the very distant future exoplanets. And um, it's becoming very unpopular to say colonize, or we're trying to actively tell others, like, maybe we shouldn't say colonize, maybe we should say explore or visit, um, and rethinking it, like, as scientists and, like, NASA decadal surveys are starting to, like, include that in thinking about the next 10 years. And so, um, I'm really curious about this section in your project on anti-colonial thinking and what that's going to look like. Thank you, Natalia. I hope um, maybe we can connect because I'd be really interested in talking to you a little bit about the kinds of language changes that you're seeing and the kinds of documents that I might be able to look at to talk about this because I think that's fascinating that, that you know, because if you look at NASA stuff, it's pretty colonial focused, at least during the periods I've been looking at. So it's interesting that they've kind of cottoned on that this might not be the best framing for this. And they might want to think rhetorically about changing the way that they talk about um, their their exhibition, their, their traveling to exoplanets and Mars and other spaces. Um, I'm trying to think, okay, I, I'm hoping I'm not losing the thread of your question. Um, could you just repeat the last part that you said? Because I think I've lost that thread. Yeah, I was curious if you could give like a brief outline or like teaser of like what um, what the path is going to be for like the anti-colonialist yeah. parts of your project. So it is interesting because there are, so I mentioned Ray Bradbury earlier. Um, the Martian Chronicles is actually science fiction that's very anti, is, is sort of focused towards anti-colonialism um, because what he talks about is how one, you know, like, um, so the, the space travelers go to Earth, the, the Martians aren't too excited about having them there. Like they don't think it's great and they end up like trying to eliminate them until of course all the Martians die of a disease that's brought from Earth, right? Which is um, analogic to the smallpox uh, outbreak uh, in the United States after European settlers got here. So we see a lot of this sort of like, he's reminding us of 
um, all of the the atrocities essentially um, that occurred um, when uh, uh, when they colonized North America, right? So these are very much present in Bradbury's work, which is interesting given the sort of juxtaposition that it has with that quote that I showed you earlier. So there's sort of like maybe a fraught um, relationship for him about about this moment about going to Mars. The other thing, there is a very interesting environmental argument where, um, you know, humans go to Mars and they trash it. So they're throwing junk in the canal and they're essentially doing the same thing to this planet that they did to Earth, right? So this notion that humans aren't going to change and they're just going to get this new beautiful planet and they're going to destroy it. And I think Kim Stanley Robinson also talks, he, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of discussion about terraforming, which is a very central part of his novel. Um, and so terraforming is going to be an interesting um, way of thinking about colonialism because it's like uber colonialism. You're not only like showing up in a place, you're just completely transforming it so that you can live there, right? Which, you know, um, we've done that in a number of ways on earth, but this is like taking it to the next level where you're just totally taking this ecology of a planet and completely changing it so it suits your own needs, right? So there's that issue. Um, there's also issues of race. There's issues, uh, especially, res so um, I don't know if you guys know Gil Scott Heron, but he has this really great song called Whitey's on the Moon, right? Where he talks about how essentially, you know, we could be using the money for space projects for social projects on earth. Um, why don't we do that? Um, there's also the same environmental arguments about why don't we use the money that we could be exploring Mars to work on climate change on Earth, right? Why why don't we worry about our own planet and not worry about going living on other planets? Um, but sort of the, the racial inequities also come out in other kinds of stories um, about questions of like, so they're, they're like, I think it's Philip K. Dick where he talks a lot about like, these people go to the moon and they work as miners. Like, who are these miners? Like, well, they end up being people that were poor on Earth that they could just sort of exploit and send to Mars, which is a terrible environment to extract resources and then bring them back to earth for everybody else who's rich. So there's there's a lot of this, this sort of notion that colonialism is going to be, um, they're gonna colonize, they're gonna just, they're, it's, gonna, it's gonna be extractive of resources. You're gonna have the same folks on earth that are taking risks and labor to take those risks on Mars and on other planets. You also see this in the expanse, right? Where um, the, the folks that are working um, and I can't, I, I can't recall the name right now. The folks that work on the outer rim of the asteroids are all like sort of poor um, folks that are, you know, their rights are trampled on and they're just sort of exploited for their labor in these very dangerous spaces. So we see those, so, th so those are like, that's a preview of the kind of things that I'd like to talk about. Um, and I'd be interested to hear from anyone else if there are other kinds of issues that I think are worth talking about um, with respect. And, and of course, Afrofuturism, um, if we want to talk about race and space, that's something also that's important to talk about and think about. Thanks. I'm going to go back to the Q&A. Um, let's see, where was I? Um, from anonymous attendee, have you read and do you have uh, thoughts on a memory called Empire, often noted as an anti-imperial space opera? Thank you. I have not read that. So um, thank you so much for bringing it to my attention. I just wrote it down. I've got a little tablet here of writing down stuff people are asking and saying. Uh, so a memory called Empire, um, I am going to explore that. Thank you for the source. I'm always, I, the more I can get, the more I can look at, the better I, the happier I am, the better I feel. Um, next from Yen Ui, uh, have you read Hao Jing Fang's Vagabond? And if so, what are your thoughts on whether there is a difference in the ideas of colonization in this Chinese science fiction text compared to the English texts that you use? So um, I, have not, I have not read Vagabond. I've heard about it. Um, there is also another text whose name escapes me right now, but I think is by a Chinese author. And the whole um, premise of the story is that um, essentially, Earth sends and receives signals from an extraterrestrial life form. Um, and then they realize, oh, my God, if someone can send and receive these signals, it's very likely that they're going to, like, come to us and that we're going to be colonized. 
So there's about, oh uh, yes, thank you. The three body problem. Thank you so much. Um, the name of the novel is a three body problem. Um, or, uh, and so the idea is that, you know, what if, what if we should maybe not be sending all these messages out into space because we could be the next place to get colonized by some, uh, by some, some folks out there that have more technology than we do. Um, so that's a very interesting sort of alternative perspective. Um, but of course, you know, there are the sci-fi five flicks from the, the 50s and 60s where, you know, uh, extraterrestrials come to Earth um, and like how to serve man, right, as a menu and not uh, and not a doctrine about how to help men. Um, so anyway, uh, I think that was the day the Earth stood still. But but there are lots of there are lots of examples like that where you have films about Earth being colonized. But I think the Chinese writers that that particular series, I think, is very interesting. The three body problem. Thanks. Um, I've been going to the list a lot. Are there um, are there other graduate students or anyone else on screen who wants to ask a question? Um, okay, I'm going to go back to the list then, and then I have one other question, but I, I'll I'll go through um, a couple more. Um, oh, this is from Ricardo again. What factor commands the Massive commitment of national resources to explore a hostile environment and not the ocean. Yeah, interesting. That's a great question. Um, factor, of course, is um, international. One factor is international prestige. So, one of the chapters I'm going to be devoting my in, to my book on is about the politics of of you know space research and and Mars colonization. Um, because think of if you think about it. Um, there's a really famous speech by Kennedy. Um, it's called his moon speech, which was given at, at Rice University in, I think, 1961 or 63. Um, and in the speech, he, sent, he essentially says, and this is the per ardua argument I was talking about in my talk, of argument from difficulty. He says, we go to the moon not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And the idea is that if because it's hard, if you can show that you can do it, then you're better than everyone else. So essentially, it's a way of you know, having national prestige. Um, and it's worth putting a lot of money into um, endeavors that show your national prestige. Um, so if you think about Mars, and especially Mars in the last like two months, um, China, the United States, and the United Arab Emirates have all sent um, either probes or landers or all of the above to Mars. Um, and the notion is that there is a new, in my estimation, a new space race on India, China, the United States, the European Union, Everyone is competing for these, uh, for reaching these extraterrestrial spaces and living on them. Um, so I think that this is going to be heating up in the way that it was heating up uh, in the 1960s. And, and, and Kennedy's speech, I think, is very evocative of um, what I see happening now. So why would we spend the resources? Um, because if we don't, we're going to be second. And um, we can't have national pride uh, of place. So... I think that that might be one reason why we will do it. You've been very uh, uh, good about answering a lot of questions. I, I love, these are great questions. I, um, I do this. So I'm gonna take one more from, from the Q&A and then, then um, I have one, one last kind of follow-up. Um, and this is, well, there are a couple of recommendations. Um, uh, a couple of scholarly recommendations for following up on some of the earlier comments. Mark Jernig's uh, Racial Worldmaking, The Power of Popular Fiction, uh, and John Ryder's Colonialism and the Emergence of Science Fiction. Um, and then in the other list, there's a reference to Parable of the Sower. Um, and uh, have you read Parable of the Sower and thought about the rhetoric for dispersing through the cosmos like seed on the wind? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very common trope, actually. Um, Isaac Asimov talks a lot about this. Um, he talks a lot about us as the footloose Vikings of the future, um, interstellar Vikings, that is. So we get in our long ships and we go out and, and we spread the spread humanity throughout the universe. Um, and a lot of the argument there is, well, you know, you have all these blank spaces. And what we want to do is we want to create awareness of these spaces. And you can't have awareness without people, so therefore we'll bring people there. Um, it kind of goes back to Vivek, your your notion of terra nullis. 
Um, so where there is this idea that, well, if, if, if nothing's there, it's not very valuable, but if people are there, we can make value of it. Um, we can make it exist in a way that it doesn't exist if there aren't people there. So um, there's some very interesting arguments. Definitely this, this footloose Viking of the future is Arthur C. Clarke, Asimov, all of those guys talk about this and a lot. Thanks. So uh, what I wanted to just circle back to, um, and I think I, I was still kind of um, trying to articulate this, but um, it goes back to, I guess, the question I asked about whether or what kind of rhetorical moves are being made um, to to uh, represent certain spaces around the globe as colonizable by Europeans. In other words, what is necessary? Um, you know, and and this is why you know I think that that the kind of um, early articulations of race and racial difference and the kind of emergence of racial science um, that. You know, in a sense, those are those are the rhetorical, um, the the repositories of the rhetorical moves that are being made to render um, uh, to render certain spaces inhabited by non-European people um, considered like fair game, right? And yeah. so, I guess that that's that's part of what I was getting about getting at earlier, and whether you know whether you can sort of talk about the tracts um, without talking about a kind of underlying um, set of assumptions about colonize, colon, colonizability um, that, uh, that maybe don't appear in the tracts because they're already sort of settled through other kinds of rhetorics of civilization, of racial superiority, of you know, Christian religion in relation to other religions. Um, so I'm just interested to, to hear a bit um, about that before we close out. Yeah, thank you. And, it, and, and this is gonna send me back deep into history if, you don't, if, you, if you'll bear with me for a second. Um, so yes, there, there are very formal arguments about this. Um, and what some people may be surprised to know is that uh, particularly the Spanish, were very concerned. I mean, initially they were fine with whatever was happening, but then they got really concerned about it. Um, and they actually had a series of debates about whether that this was even appropriate. And by looking at those debates, you can see sort of what are the bases of argumentation. And it, it has a has a history that goes beyond um, uh, even, even the, the, the 1492 journey of Columbus. Um, essentially, so, in order for a place to be considered um, colonizable or like, you know, that you can claim as uh, property, right? So, so the, the word, the, the appropriate word is dominion. So a place that you can go and claim dominion over, right? Um, there were a couple of things. So one um, is that that place, that space cannot be occupied by a, a Christian king. So Christianity comes into it, right? There has to be uh, there, if there's a Christian king there, it's a no-go. You can't just claim dominion over that. Um, the second thing is there were lots of debates over um, whether or not the persons in that space were civilized. So this goes all the way back to Aristotle. And if you if you look at the debates over um, these spaces, there are certain criteria you have to meet to be considered civilized. You had to have a language. You had to have a written language. You had to have um, a social structure um, that was that was obvious, like a hierarchical structure with like kings and whatever. Um, also, you could make a case for civilization based on um, buildings. Um, so, like if you had a town and things were laid out and you had temples and stuff. So, one of the challenges was, you know, the people that were against um, these these early colonial pushes, especially by the Spanish, were like, look, they have written language. They have towns, they have kings. Like, you know, you, you can't claim that these people don't have, they're not civilized because they actually do have all these things. Um, there were other parts of the doctrine though, like cannibalism. So if you were a cannibalistic society, you could not be considered civilized, right? Because that is the most sort of uncivil thing you could do is to eat other people. 
Um, so a lot of the sort of false arguments about cannibalism amongst certain um, groups of, of indigenous peoples were all aimed at suggesting that they're not civilized, right? Because they couldn't make an argument on these other grounds. So, so there was, there, those were, one, that's one set of arguments. So you had the sort of like the legal arguments about the Christian king, the arguments about whether the people are civilized. And then there was a third set of arguments um, that were, that were, that were actually sort of like economic arguments. Um, so a lot of, a lot of folks that were doing colonization were trying to find a middle way where they were saying like, okay, we recognize you're civilized. We recognize your, your dominion to some degree over these places that you're in. But what we see is that there are all these uncultivated spaces. And so what we're suggesting is that if a space is uncultivated, like there's not fields, there's not, you know, uh, animal husbandry, we can occupy that space. Why? Because you're not using it. Right? So in this way, they're not suggesting, though, that they have dominion over the whole space. They're just suggesting that they can move into specific niches, which are undeveloped, and develop them and claim dominion through development. So there's also this sort of third argument about dominion through development. So those are like the three, I would say, main cases that people are making about why it's okay to colonize. Yeah, the last one is, is quite interesting in the sense that, you know, the it is another place where you can see the intersection of capitalism and um, and and the, these colonial processes that you're talking about, because um, capitalism only sees land as productive when it's right when it's a productive in a capitalist way. Right. In fact, I think it's from Locke and his discussion of property that a lot of people draw these these arguments from. Mm. Right. Well, we're we're just two minutes over time. Um, thank you again for for fielding um, quite a quite a number of questions. Um, and thank you for for sharing your work with us and and um, and congratulations. Well, thank thank on you that. all for just a wonderful conversation and great questions. Um, definitely keeping me on my toes, trying to get me to remember all the stuff that that I've read or thought about. So I really appreciate that, and I'm I'm glad to hear your questions because it also informs the kinds of topics and issues that I do want to explore as I develop this book. As I said. It's in it's in its proto it's in proto stages, right? So, um, I've I have one chapter written, but I'm looking forward to writing the other ones based on the feedback and discussions I've had here. So, thank you so much. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to everyone who um, who attended today, and we'll see you next week. Great.